Meet the Aquanics is now sponsored by Audible.com. As part of this sponsorship, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day trial so you can check out the range of titles that they're offering. Currently, Audible has over 180,000 books to choose from for either your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. To help support this podcast, please go to www.audibletrial.com slash And now, on with our next episode. Hello, everyone. Um, this episode of Meet the Aquanics is another offline episode. Uh, we were lucky enough last week to talk with uh, Professor Seth Lloyd from MIT, who is one of the pioneers in quantum information technology. Um, he was in Japan recently for his usual tour, and he was gracious enough to sit down with me and have a chat for about 45 minutes to talk about uh, his opinions when it comes to quantum technology, um, where the field is going, and some of the stuff that he's been working on recently. Um, so everyone, please enjoy. Thank you. So, I mean, so you've been in this business for quite a while. Um, did you come from the physics side or did you come from computer science and engineering or those kind of things? Yeah, well, my, um, uh, my PhD is in physics, and, um, but actually my interest in quantum information stems from when I, I did a master's in history and philosophy of science at Cambridge University from 1983 to 84. And... Uh, I decided I would work on problems about information and quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. This was before there was a field called quantum information. And uh, I became very interested in, in those problems, also in problems of you know, simple two-level systems and uh, quantum gravity. And uh, <clears throat> so then I worked on those during my PhD and on my postdocs. So ironically, everything I do now is based on my one graduate degree in humanities. Oh, so you blame humanities for your interest in quantum uh, I blame I blame humanities for my interest in quantum information. <laughs> <laughs> so in what aspect? I mean, we, we were talking with, you know, Mark Everett from Loughborough? He does a lot of foundational stuff and work along that. Is that really sort of what pushed you into sort of understanding more about what quantum is and you know, these ideas of interpretations and foundational issues? And then sort of the information side sort of just sort of came out of that as a, as a means to explaining it. Yeah, well, well, um, yeah, I did this MPhil because I never really kind of understood this whole business about, you know, electrons being in two places at once when mm -hmm. I was taking introductory quantum mechanics from Norman Ramsey at Harvard. And uh, actually it was at 8.30 in the morning and he'd turn off the lights and put up transparencies and I'd fall asleep. So, <laughs> but I, I thought it would be interesting to look at, kind of, at foundational questions. But in fact, and, and I did spend a lot of time... Uh, in that first year when I was doing the MPhil and studying about questions of entanglement and um, various kinds of quantum paradoxes. But my, my goal was really actually to look more at, at problems about, for instance, how can you talk about the second law of thermodynamics in terms of pure quantum states? Um, uh, again, how can you relate problems of quantum mechanics to kind of fundamental questions of quantum mechanics and gravitational systems? So, and then in the... the uh, uh, in the, I mean, you have to remember that during the 1980s there were only a half dozen people working on these problems anyway. And uh, around um, 1989 or 1990, I became interested in the question of how you might build a quantum computer. So I started looking at, you know, necessary and sufficient criteria for quantum systems to be able to compute. Um, and I, at first I thought that, that you could describe this in just in terms of looking at the spectrum. So, you know, if the spectrum supports computation, then there's some basis with respect to which it computes. But then so I found the that all... The spectrum of... Of your... Suppose you have a Hamiltonian system, right? Ah. And, uh, and so I started looking at the question of when, when does, a, uh, does a Hamiltonian system have a spectrum that supports computation? But it turns out that almost any Hamiltonian system has a spectrum that com supports mm -hmm. computation. The problem is, in order to figure out the computational basis, you have to perform all the computations in advance. Ah, okay. So then I started we're looking more practically around 1992, 1991 to 1992, about how you would use um, methods of electromagnetic resonance, um, uh, atom optical resonance, to build a quantum computer. And I wrote this paper in 1992. It was published in 1993 about how you build quantum computers using electromagnetic resonance. And... Uh, that that uh, so it was really the first paper about how you might actually build a quantum computer, and then of course those techniques um, 
uh, turned out to be very useful. They're the basis for NMR quantum computing. They're the basis for superconducting quantum computing. And then I subsequently um, uh, started working with people doing NMR quantum computing and then worked with the first, on the first experiments doing superconducting quantum computing. I worked with um, Saya Nakamura here at NEC doing superconducting quantum computing in the early 2000s. So and NMR was sort of really the first. They, they were the first groups that sort of got their teeth into it and started demonstrating... You know, basic operations and yeah, and stuff exactly. Like that. Yeah, so Dave Corey did the first, I think, a Toffley gate back in 1995 or 1996, and Neil Gershenfeld and Ike Chuang and I did the very first first demonstrations of um, Grover's algorithm and Deutsch Josa algorithm in 1996, 1997, using NMR. Of course, NMR doesn't. Um, uh, uh, scale, and we knew that at the time. Uh, so why doesn't NMR scale? Room temperature NMR doesn't scale because actually you're in room temperature NMR you extract the signal that corresponds to the ground state of the system out of the remaining states of the system, but that signal decreases exponentially um, in the number of qubits at, at high temperature because the fraction of the of the state which is in the ground state goes as you know two to the minus m or n as the number of qubits. I mean, so NMR also is sort of the foundational technology for magnetic resonance imaging and stuff. It's the same basic techniques as in those machines. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, the the kinds of quantum logic operations that are performed using NMR, um, these kinds of quantum logic operations, like you know swap operations and controlled bit flip operations, like controlled knots, people had the basic techniques for that back actually in the late 1940s. So they could have actually done simple quantum computation back in the 40s and 50s had they uh, known about it. They understood what it was. <laughs> so it's sort of like the, the way that, that atomic clocks and, and, and precision measurements sort of evolved into iron trap computing. This kind of stuff evolved into NMR computing. And hopefully the silicon industry will evolve into silicon quantum computing. And yeah, that would be nice. I think it's a little harder... Silicon-based quantum computing is, is tough to build, though, I mean, right now there's some very beautiful experiments with linear optics that involve um, uh, integrated optics on, on silicon, so, uh, which is a very powerful technology for doing, for doing linear optics and might also form a really nice technology for doing, um, you know, uh, knill lafam milburn or cluster state quantum computing. Mm -hmm. So you've, I mean, you've had your fingers pretty much in every technological pie since it's been developed. What's your favorite? Uh, that's like asking a parent who is their favorite, <laughs> who, who is their favorite child. Uh, no, I mean, I, yeah, I mean... Well, I've always argued that there's, there's a spectrum. There's technologies that are going to be easier, but they're going to be larger, bigger, more expensive, slower. And then there are technologies that are going to be better in all those metrics, but they're going to be harder and harder to build. Well, all these technologies are great. I mean, you know, they're, they're the NMR continues to be a great technology for small... Uh, for small quantum computers just because it's so precise and you can perform many logical operations. Um, I'm very, I mean, the superconducting technologies, that, that has been really wonderful. I mean, when we first, so I was on the first experiments uh, to design and build flux qubits with Hans Moe at Delft back in the late 90s and early 2000s. And back then, um, due to a variety of reasons, the coherence times were not very good, and we mm -hmm. spent years struggling with trying to get them up until... Uh, a lot of people like Rob Shulkoff and John Martinez managed to make a series of breakthroughs that got them so that they're really superconducting circuits are now very viable uh, technologies for building large scale quantum computers. A lot of people think that they're going to be the first. Uh, yeah, it used I mean, to be I, iron traps, but now yeah. it looks as though there might be a leapfrog happening. Oh, I think that that's, that that could easily be true. I mean, I, I don't want to predict it. Uh, people with ion traps have have also been making steady progress, but there are the problems of scaling up to multiple ion traps. You can only make a single ion trap so big, and then so if you actually want to do quantum computing with ion traps, you have to find a way of linking ion traps together, either by moving ions from one to another or by you know teleporting quantum information from one to another. Those problems remain hard, but I think there are you know good reasons to suspect that that will work out. And the quantum optical techniques and the atom optical techniques, um, you know, those are also difficult, but they prove tremendous for, you know, um, doing precision measurement. Uh, Dave Weinland's quantum logic quantum clock mm -hmm. has been the most precise uh, optical frequency atomic clock in the world, which means the most precise optical atomic clock in the world for almost a decade now. So the techniques for quantum information for precision measurement there you can apply them for many, many systems other than uh, 
other than things that would make full-blown quantum computers. So we don't talk about that much on previous episodes that we've done of this, but obviously there's quantum computers, which we talk about a lot, because that's what I'm interested in, quantum communications networks, but then there's all this other stuff that you're alluding to, quantum sensing, metrology, all of these other things that I'm not terribly familiar with. So a lot of people look at this as sort of maybe the stepping stone technology to something more large scale. Is this a fair assessment of what it is? I don't know if it's a stepping stone technology for something more large scale, but you know, basically all sensors have their accuracy limited by quantum mechanics at bottom. And so it's not so surprising that, that these techniques from quantum information are being used for that. I mean, already, you know, the, as I mentioned, the quantum logic quantum clock operates by exchanging by entangling a microwave transition with an optical transition and by exchanging quantum information between you know, microwave qubit and an optical qubit. And um, uh, uh, the, it's been known for decades that, that um, uh, the best accuracy for interferometers, like a Mach center interferometer, is obtained by injecting squeezed vacuum into one of the ports. And then this is actually going to be the basis for next generation LIGO. Um, to up the sensitivity of LIGO to its maximum possible value. Oh, so they haven't integrated this into the, the, the LIGO that was successful last year? No, they're in the process of doing it. So, so this is an idea uh, that was proposed by Carlton Caves back in the 80s and recently shown by Caves and others to, um, to be the optimal uh, technique for interferometry, injecting squeeze vac vacuum. And uh, Norgus Malval at MIT is in charge of the LIGO effort for doing that, and they're, they're doing lots of experiments. They've done proof of principle experiments. And so, I mean, LIGO is a huge experiment. So their long-term goal is to, is to incorporate these techniques from quantum information into uh, uh, a, upping the sensitivity of LIGO by another order of magnitude or so. Okay. So any other... I mean, a few other people have spoken about in terms of, of magnetometry yeah. um, and being able to sense, sense incredibly small magnetic fields using sort of diamond-based qubits and the applications of this to either biology or, uh, when I was talking to a couple of the Australians, um, mineral searching, searching for mineral deposits. Yeah, so actually, so NV diamond is a wonderful material, both for quantum computing and for, and for metrology. Um, actually, uh, Salim Shah, Phil Hemmer, and I wrote the first paper back, a couple of papers back in the late 1990s, uh, around 2000, proposing to use uh, NV diamond for quantum computation and then doing some experiments. And this, this subsequently became much more trendy now. It's trendy now, quite trendy at the moment. Um, and, uh, but NV diamond is a fantastic uh, material for using you know, small numbers of qubits, entangling them to do Heisenberg limited magnetometry. So there, and because diamond is a very inert material, it could be very useful for biosensing. That is, you know, you could get things to ingest it and then zap them mm -hmm. with lasers and then figure out magnetic fields inside cells. So, sorry, what's the term Heisenberg limited? Ah, uh, yeah, so... Without, without getting too technical. Yeah, so, so the ordinary, um, you know, when you're measuring some quantity and you're doing things in kind of a kind of run-of-the-mill, ho-hum, classical kind of way, um, then uh, your precision for measuring a parameter goes as the square root of the number of samples. It just comes from the central limit theorem. You know, you average things together, and the standard deviation goes as the square root of the number of measurements. Uh, but if you're able to use quantum coherence in your measurements and quantum entanglement, then you can get the accuracy to go as the number of measurements rather than the square root of the number of measurements. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a, a potentially a big win um, uh, for uh, measurement. You need to use, typically you need to use funky effects like squeezing and entanglement to attain this. But this 1 over n scaling is called Heisenberg limited measurement. The square root of n scaling is called shot noise limited measurement. So by using funky quantum effects, you can quite generically go from square root of n accuracy to n accuracy, and uh, which is is actually pretty much always the best you can do. Mm -hmm. So Heisenberg limited metrology is is a buzzword for describing this kind of ultimate accuracy for measurement obtainable by 
quantum, funky quantum effects. Yeah, I remember some friend after a few drinks at a bar wanted to try to apply it to sports teams, and I just thought it was <laughs> the, only, the kind of thing you could do after a few drinks. Yeah, so. Heisenberg limited saber metrics. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, just just how many premierships or how many Super Bowls you win over the course of a over a sports team. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but a lot of the stuff that you work on, certainly the stuff that I see of yours, is very much in this kind of... There's, there's one aspect that's certainly very technologically heavy, but there's also this aspect of your work that's very sort of... You do look at the spookiness of quantum mechanics and you do try to derive some interesting possible experiments that you could do to prove one way or the other way. Like some of the stuff you did on closed time like curves, and I oh, know you've got... Yeah. Most of your talks on YouTube that you see are either related to closed close time light curves or quantum uh, biology. Well, that seems to yeah. be the, <laughs> the ones that show up online. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe the quantum biology one could be because I have this interpretive modern dance to explain the <laughs> quantum efficiency of energy transport and photosynthesis. So I like to think that it's my ability as an interpretive modern dancer rather than any... any uh, oh, the theory. talks are very entertaining to watch. It's <laughs> certainly not an area that I look in very much. So, But the closed time like curve stuff people seem to... A, can't wrap their heads around and B, either are very happy that you're doing it or become very, very angry for one way or another. Uh, well, yeah, so, I, so I mean, actually... The public I, perception of, of uh, quantum... <laughs> that when you're running into this sort of very interpretational issues and people can get a little riled up about this. Not, not just the physics community. Closed time light curves are, are, and anything involving time travel is always, a, always an issue. And since we actually not only redid the theory of closed time light curves, the quantum theory of closed time light curves, but then did an experiment where the experiment was the moral equivalent of sending a photon a few nanoseconds backwards in time and having it try to kill its former self. I can see how members of the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Photons might have been annoyed. Mm, well, if you can do it to physicists, then it's fine. <laughs> photons, maybe not. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, you know, the, the, the reason I'm interested in, in, in quantum computation and ideas about quantum information is not so much to build a large quantum computer where you could factor large numbers and thereby prevent people from buying stuff over the internet, which would be a pity. Uh, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> Depends what they're buying. <laughs> well, I don't know. Buying. People buy all kinds of stuff. Mm. <laughs> but uh, 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 I mean, I think the quantum information is basically a, a language that describes all of discrete quantum mechanics. And since actually quantum mechanics is fundamentally discrete, that's kind of quantum information is a universal language for describing quantum mechanics. And that means that, that you know, we can apply ideas from quantum information to understand ideas in quantum gravity, which really was my um, original motivation for uh, trying to look at, at quantum mechanics and uh, information, was actually to try to construct a quantum information-based theory of quantum gravity, mm -hmm. um, which I struggled with for decades. And now, actually, this is becoming very trendy as well in the last few years. But then also, and closed time like curves, of course, are an aspect of this because closed time like curves, uh, which is effectively time travel, are allowed in Einstein's theory of general relativity. So then you really have to ask and try to answer the question of how does this work on the ground in mm -hmm. a quantum mechanical setting. And so we did do this, uh, redo the theory of closed time like curves to do a version based on, it's basically based on teleportation and escape from black holes. It's got every funky thing you can imagine in it. And so these ideas can then throw light on, you know, on, on closed time light curves. Moreover, also on what happens if you, when you fall into a black hole, can you escape from a black hole? Does the information that falls into a black hole escape? Which is a question of... This is this information theory paradox. Yeah, there's a black hole information paradox, which is that when Hawking first noted that black holes radiate, he said, well, they radiate, but they radiate a thermal state, so the information is still destroyed. And then there's been a series of arguments over the last decades about whether the information escapes from a black hole. Um, string theorists uh, and people who believe in the so-called anti-de Sitter space conformal field theory correspondence, the ADS-CFT correspondence, take it as an article of faith that all the information escapes from a black hole, but they have a hard time explaining how that might happen. But, but quantum information and techniques based on quantum information are a very useful form of techniques for actually analyzing what might happen in a black hole or in closed time light curves, or for that matter, in quantum gravity. In fact, next week I'm going to be in Kyoto for a conference exactly on problems of quantum information and quantum gravity. So I think that, that you know, my motivation for this is, is, has been always to use 
quantum information from the theoretical side as a language for understanding the way the universe works. And then, you know, since we can build quantum computers, and I do have, now have a lot of experience, you know, with actually many, you know, as you mentioned, I was kind of there at the get-go for many of the fundamental technologies for actually building quantum computers and participated in the experiments. You know, if you can actually do an experiment where you do effective demonstration of a closed time-like curve, then maybe you should, though... Uh, though one of the sad side effects is that every month... That I get... comment should get comments. <laughs> well, every month since we did the first, the exp first experiments on this, and um, uh, I've received a plaintive email from someone saying, I am a time traveler trapped in your time. My time machine is broken. Can I use your time machine to go back to my own time? Yeah, see, now seriously, you get these emails, but what makes you discriminate whether one's actually true? Well, I mean, one, one day, if you know, if somebody does accidentally travel back through time because of this technology to this time period, you'd be one of the first people that you would try and email about it. I'm not. I'm not. I don't write back to them saying that they're wrong. I write, simply write back to them saying that our quantum time travel uh, machine is at a too early a stage for you to risk trying to go back in time. Yet, yeah, so, exactly. so I wouldn't. I wouldn't. If I were you, I wouldn't try to use it. So I'm not making a judgment about whether they are actually really time travelers or not. <laughs> but I mean, of all these fundamental things that you're talking about, whether it's the black hole information paradox, closed time-like curves, um, interpretational issues about quantum mechanics, have you felt that quantum information has, you know, they've provided pathways that you can investigate these things, but is there any specific instance you can think of that it really it was quantum information that said, no, now we do think we understand this, where before we didn't? Well, I think for the more speculative things, such as, you know, closed time-like curves and escaping from black hole and quantum gravity, there uh, we're unlikely to get any, any kind of resolution of what the correct theory is soon, for the simple reason that these are systems that are, are by and large, not, not empirically accessible. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big believer in that theories are not proved until they're substantiated by experiment. And uh, so it's not strange that, we're, I, that we haven't resolved those, those questions. Um, moreover, in the case of quantum gravity, since people have been trying and failing to uh, uh, quantize gravity for 100 years, I think we really should just have a conference celebrating 100 years of failing to quantize general relativity. It would be a good, good addition to the Einstein year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although, you know, he's done pretty well over the last 100 years. We, I think we can give ourselves a bit more buffer room before we have to worry about solving quantum mechanics and gravity. But in cases like, for instance, in the role of quantum mechanics in photosynthesis, so I think that our, our quantum information-based theories, so in, here I'm referring to the ones that with Alan asper Guzik and our collaborators and uh, the work that Martin Plenio and his collaborators have done on this, then, then I think that you know, the theories are straightforward. They're a straightforward application of techniques of open quantum systems from quantum information to photosynthetic systems. They're strongly substantiated by experiment, and they provide a simple and straightforward quantum information-based explanation of how you attain high-energy transport in photosynthesis. And I think in that case, I think that we're on very solid ground. So this is this idea that in certain biological systems, if evolution could have taken advantage of quantum mechanics, it would have. And in this case, you think you found a system where it has. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not surprising in I mean, retrospect. people talk about sort of the entire brain being a quantum machine and all this kind of stuff, which I'm not part of that camp. Well, yeah, I mean, the Penrose, the Penrose Hameroff theory of the brain performing, you know, quantum computation is just completely wrong. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and, and indeed the thing that makes photosynthesis capable of taking advantage of uh, coherence and entanglement um, is that the timescales all line up, you know. The, the time scales in photosynthesis range from femtoseconds from initial absorption events to tens to hundreds of femtoseconds for coherent hopping events to picoseconds for incoherent hopping events for, to nanoseconds for the lifetimes of excitons. And so you have a wide range of, of time scales and there's plenty of scope for quantum coherence. Mm. Whereas in the brain, if you actually look at the time scales for neurons firing, then on the time scales of neurons firing, and given the time scales for decoherence of neurons, de neurons decohere, you know, billions of times faster than they can fire. Um, I mean, you might be able to, one place where quantum mechanics might play a role in biological systems in general is in receptor dynamics. 
um, where I think there's considerable hope that, you know, in latching of molecules into receptors that quantum mechanics could play a strong role, though we don't have strong exper empirical evidence for that yet. Um, uh, however, for the brain as a whole, I don't think that, that uh, we, uh, we have, I think it's very unlikely that, you know, in the neural functioning, we'd see quantum coherence. I mean, look, you know, th this Pendrose argument is basically of the form, quantum mechanics is weird, quantum gravity is weird, consciousness is weird, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be cool if they were all the same thing? But frankly, they're not. Yeah. No, I completely agree. <laughs> the, yeah, the, pen, the Penrose brain is a, is a lot of fun, but yeah. Penrose, I should say, is a very smart person and deserves a great deal of credit for actually proposing a, a theory of the action of quantum mechanics in the brain in a specific place that is in the formation of, of um, microtubules, which is a computational kind of process. Mm -hmm. However, it's a very decoherent and uh, dissipative uh, process. And very shortly after Penrose and Hameroff proposed this, Max Tegmark wrote a paper showing, you know, well, look, this is not quantum coherent. Um, that Penrose, is, I think, still holds on to the notion that it might be quantum coherent. But I think most sensible I no people... Problem. I have no problem with that. I have no problem with people throwing out crazy ideas, even if they're wrong. Well, and crazy ideas that are empirically testable. Mm -hmm. So I think this is great. But I, I think it's been empirically tested and shown to be incorrect. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's fine, too. It shouldn't stop people from throwing out crazy ideas. Um, but, I mean, certainly when it comes to, to well, what's now sort of being called quantum biology, um, we're sort of in that investigative phase. I mean, the same way quantum information had sort of its investigative phase sort of in the late 80s, early 90s, and then started to move into an engineering phase, now we're starting to move into a commercialization phase. Um, are we sliding in when you talk about photosynthesis um, and quantum mechanics involved in photosynthetic compounds. This obviously has applications for the solar industry. Oh yeah, and, and we've actually moved into the phase of actually building devices. So over the last three years, I've been working with Angela Belcher in material sciences at MIT and with uh, Munji Buwendi and Dota Isola. Um, Dota is an assist assistant professor at uh, City College. And uh, uh, they, we've been, um, Angela is using her ability to genetically program viruses to make all kinds of cool systems to engineer photosynthetic collecting viruses covered with chromophores that operate in a squarely quantum mechanical regime, and we have strong evidence that we've been able to succeed with that. And this, is, this has allowed us to enhance the diffusion length of excitons in these artificial systems by a large amount using exactly the same kinds of methods that biological systems have used. So what do you need the viruses for? The viruses are a template, and you template you, you, the, the you, NG genetically engineers them to have different kinds of proteins that then bind organic dyes and cro or that is to say chromophores, the same kinds of things that are the basis for or, uh, photosynthesis in living systems. Mm -hmm. And by, by tuning the coupling strengths of the dyes and how tightly packed they are on the surface of the virus, you can make a system that has excellent excitonic diffusion lengths, which is exactly what you need for organic solar cells. And basically, they collect photons really, really well and transmit them to where they need to go. They collect photons. The photons form excitons, little particles of energy. And the particles of energy, the excitons, move from one place to another on the virus by in a method that, that takes advantage of quantum coherence. And even more impressive are, are these J-aggregate systems, which are just chromophores, you know, light-sensitive molecules that are just bound to each other in an effective molecular crystal. These are the systems that are built by Delta Isola <coughs> and... Uh, uh, in conjunction with Munji Buendi at MIT, we've been able to show that these have um, uh, you know, propagation lengths for these excitons, these particle of energies that are far, far longer than anything that you find in conventional organic solar cells. So not only have we, you know, we've, not only did we study um, and make, you know, very powerful theories of how, well, confirmed by experiment of how um, excitons and energy propagates in photosynthesis be using quantum hanky-panky. But we applied lessons at the same quantum hanky-panky mm -hmm. to construct um, physical systems that could well be used in uh, much more efficient organic solar cells. So how, how much, because what are, what are non-organic, what are the state-of-the-art solar cells? What are their collection efficiencies at the moment, like 20%? Ish? Yeah, so there, I think good silicon solar cells can, can easily be higher than 20%. And is there any... Estimate or solid estimate as to what something built from this technology could hit. 
Uh, no, we don't know because actually, the the in this case, the, um, the this would just be for the collection part of the solar cells. A silicon solar cell, because it's a semiconductor, the energy, the excitons, an exciton is essentially an electron hole pair. So a photon comes in, creates an electron hole pair. Um, in silicon, these are so called. Um, uh, 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 one ear excitons, where the electron and hole separate, and they they collect they separately conduct in the semiconductor bands, and then you can collect them directly. Mm -hmm. And so, so a silicon solar cell is quite a simple system in some sense for just generating electricity directly. Whereas these these organic solar cells, the excitons are tightly bound within a um, a, a chromophore within a molecule, a light active molecule, like chlorophyll, for instance. Mm -hmm. They're so called Frenkel excitons, and then you need to do the same thing that photosynthesis does, which is have a charge separation uh, process where you separate the electron and hole, so you can actually build up a voltage difference. So the, it's going to be a more complicated process, so I'm not going to make any predictions for how... So that uh, engineering part we haven't quite gotten to. Today. Right, so I'm not going to make any predictions for how efficient these, these organically-based solar cells will be. I'll simply note that, the, that, the, you know, that now we actually have... Uh, excitonic diffusion lengths for these artificial systems which are much longer than occur in the best naturally occurring photosynthetic systems and so I think we're doing good mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah no, don't disagree at all I've been, I've been watching it quite uh, quite intriguingly and one of the guys who used to be at Queensland when I was doing my PhD Mohan he's, he's now very oh, yeah. much into that um, and so every time I meet up with him, it gives me a rundown of everything that's happened that I haven't been paying attention to, because I've been focusing so much on quantum computing. Yeah, it's a, well, it's an interesting. I mean, it, it's it's you know I've invaded a lot of fields in my life. So like, uh, uh, you know, starting with kind of like, for for the purpose of of um, building quantum computers, you know, starting with electromagnetic resonance, NMR, um, ESR, electron spin resonance, then. Uh, Superconducting systems, atom optics, uh, photosynthesis, uh, uh, and solid-state physics of various kinds, and and uh, 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 actually, the not surprisingly, the invader is not always welcomed with open arms. No, never. Uh, but but I think this is in all these fields that that in the end, uh, uh, the uh, it's been not so much a violent invasion, but kind of a peaceful invasion where the 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 natives and in uh, in photochemistry, have have accepted that you know these kind of techniques from quantum information can be of use and helpful in, in determining. I think it's just a good look to see how many diverse backgrounds of people in quantum information. It's not all of us who come from physics. Yeah, well, and may I say that in my case, at least, it, it I've learned uh, you you can't you know go and enter into a new field like photochemistry without having to learn a hell of a lot. And mm. and I apologize to all the photochemists out there for my extreme ignorance over the years, and I'm trying to get better. Well, <laughs> PhD and grad students are there to teach as well as to learn. <laughs> but I mean, since you've been sort of working in this and sort of seeing it evolve, certainly in the last 18 months with quantum computing, um, even from your perspective, things must have exploded from your frame of mind. That now the investment coming in from private industry and these huge multinational projects like the quantum hubs in the UK and this recent billion dollar investment that the EU is going to draw in. Um, this is a clear indication that this field is not going to die off. Yeah, absolutely. And since, I, in fact, uh, I, uh, one of the things I noticed for myself is that that uh, uh, after decades of having nobody in, be interested to hire me to help them with their quantum computers, then uh, all of a sudden I'm being asked to consult for mm. <laughs> quantum computing programs, yeah. which certainly never happened before. Yeah, it's an exciting time. I mean, I think that... that, that um, uh, you know, private companies have decided that they're going to invest in quantum computing. I mean, D-Wave has generated a lot of controversy, but they certainly have been managed to build a super cool device that does remarkable things and that exhibits many quantum mechanical effects, even if it's not clear that it's using those quantum mechanical effects to solve hard problems faster than you could do classically. But hey, they're building the device, and it's, you know, they're building, they're, they've been doubling the size of their device every couple of years in yeah. a kind of quantum Moore's Law for quantum annealers. And I suspect that we're going to find out quite soon um, whether or not uh, these devices are capable of doing uh, solving problems using funky effects like quantum tunneling that you can't solve classically. And then um, you know, Google has a, has a large program in quantum computing, 
and they managed to attract John Martinez, who was, you know, a world-class scientist there to um, try to build large-scale superconducting integrated circuits to do quantum computing and quantum annealing. And Martinez has explicitly said that he was inspired by the example of D-Wave to say, hey, we, I, can, I can do this and I can do it better. Um, IBM, of course, has a long-standing superconducting quantum computing program. There are great quantum computing programs at Delft, here in Japan. So, I mean, there's, there's I wouldn't call, and at Lincoln Labs at MIT, um, <clears throat> I, I wouldn't uh, call it an arms race, but there's a, there's a lot, there's uh, uh, fervid activity out there building ever large, more large-scale superconducting circuits. But you certainly think that this transition from being a purely academic exercise into now sort of a more hybrid model, but then will eventually flow more into an industry-focused model. That's we're well, well on the way to do this now. Yeah, there's, there's gonna, there will be no shortage of purely theoretical and experimental problems in quantum information, which industry will not answer for us. But you know, the fact that Intel just just started up a new program, Tencent and Baidu are interested in quantum computing. Mm -hmm. You know, here in Japan, uh, NTT and NEC have always had big quantum computing programs. I mean, I think that there's there's a lot of industry interest, and that's been growing rapidly. And as you mentioned, uh, 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 the, well, Canada uh, has always had a, a very big investment in quantum computing via um, the Institute for Quantum Computing in Waterloo, um, uh, which also received a big in, uh, influx, well, was really founded by uh, influx of money from Mike Lazaridis, as was the Perimeter Institute. Um, so. Uh, there, so Canada has been always been investing a lot of money. Great Britain has invested on the order of five hundred million pounds. The European Community. I've heard. I'm not sure if this is true. I've heard that they're going to increase that. Uh, yeah. In the last day or so. Maybe know. so. Maybe, maybe true. Maybe. Well, the, yeah, the European Community has has decided to do a flagship program, which will be on the order of a billion euros for investing in quantum computing. Actually, the United States, after being for I think for for decades, the kind of the world leader in terms of, uh, of the government investing money in quantum computing is now uh, uh, in danger of falling behind. Uh, but, but it's certainly exciting times, and I think it's quite likely that we'll, we'll see in the next 5 10 to 10 years um, uh, uh, quantum computers either superconducting or ion trap quantum computers, or maybe some as, un as, known, as not yet known technology, maybe NV Diamond, I don't know, that could have, you know, anywhere between 50 and 1,000 qubits and could perform tens of thousands of coherent operations uh, before losing quantum coherence. And these kinds of small-scale quantum computers, even if you're not using full-scale quantum error correction, might be able to do some super fine things and definitely be able to do uh, uh, things that classical computers can't do. So you're optimistic that without error correction, a, a digital quantum computer could beat the best classical computers with some problems. Yeah, well, absolutely. So, so um, there are quantum simulation problems where, um, uh, for quantum chemistry, for solid state physics, for things like looking at many body localization, where um, you know the quantum computers simply are going to do better than any classical computer. You just look at the at the classical problems, uh, say, of simulating a a disordered semi coherent uh, solid state system, and you know they basically are going to crap out at 30, 30 qubits, and you know we'll be there far beyond that uh, uh, for with quantum computers for for uh, quite soon. Do you think that's something that's marketable? Well, I don't know about something that's sellable. I know quantum simulation is is of very strong interest to physicists, but I don't know how uh, great interest it is for um, people, uh, you know, for companies. I mean, I've been, uh, recently my colleagues and I have developed a series of algorithms for doing machine learning on quantum computers, and I think that that's the kind of application that would be eminently um, doable, and, and because these are applications where if you could build a quantum random access memory, you could actually uh, uh, do machine learning problems and classify data and find patterns in data that you could never find using a classical computer, even if you had a small-scale quantum computer with you know, a few hundred qubits able to for perform 10,000 coherent operations. No error correction required. You could still find patterns you could never find classically. That's marketable. Right, right. So I'm, I'm asking everyone this that appears on this little podcast to make a solid prediction in the next five or 10 years. And then we'll come back in five or 10 years and find out who, who got closest. So just in the realm of quantum computing, where do you think? five or ten years? Well, I'm a little uncomfortable because I, I try never to make 
technological predictions. So I'm uh, offering a bottle of whiskey to whoever gets it right. What kind of whiskey? Whatever, whatever the person wants. <laughs> oh, whatever the whatever person they wants. want. If they're okay. on the top shelf, I'm happy to go up. Okay, the top then shelf. that case, in that case, I'll definitely go for it. Mm. Though I warn you, it could cost you. Uh, <laughs> That's all right. I'm either destitute or in a high paying position in two oh, yeah. years. Yeah. So no, no. So I, I think you know, within five years, we'll have. Uh, uh, within five to ten years, we'll have definitely performed quantum simulations of systems. We're using 50 to 100 qubits, up to 10,000 coherent operations, and uh, we'll be able to simulate quantum systems for which there will be no classical simulation, and do things like quantum principal component analysis, finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues of such systems, and this will be something no classical computer could do. I, I, I think that's pretty solid. Okay. Well, as the last thing, anything you want to plug from MIT or...? Student projects so or interesting <laughs> coming up? <laughs> well, I guess I already gave a, a plug for quantum machine learning, which I think is a great, a great field. And uh, uh, um, you know that I think that there's, there's some beautiful open questions there. I mean that, that you know we know that we can do if we could build a quantum random access memory, which I think would, is by the way a great technological application, which is worth really looking at really seriously. Um, then we could do a whole bunch of quantum machine learning algorithms like principal component analysis and, or topological algorithms you can never do classically. Um, <clears throat> uh, I also think you know, D-Wave and Google are, are, and um, uh, places like Lincoln Labs are going to be building devices with uh, both icing-like and, and non-stochastic uh, couplings where you can do deep quantum learning. You can build quantum circuits, which are the quantum analogs of classical deep learning circuits, but they're fully quantum circuits. And, mm -hmm. Um, you know, we know that at least in theory, these these can perform, uh, can construct patterns that you could never construct classically, and uh, and so maybe they can recognize patterns you can cannot recognize classically. So I think this is a great application. But I really I think the the for for all those folks out there who are interested in working in quantum information, the main thing is that um, you know this quantum information has really shown that. That it, that it is tremendously powerful for understanding all kinds of problems, just for understanding them, you know. And these applications to problems like closed time, like curves, black holes, quantum gravity, again, I don't think that we're going to know that we have the right answer until we can actually empirically test mm -hmm. what goes on with them. Though, hey, we could use quantum simulators to simulate how these different theories work with a black hole. Though, last time I asked MIT about about building a closed time like curve in the lab and pointed out we need two small black holes to make it happen. <laughs> the workplace safety issue, uh, you know, it came up and those workplace safety people just vetoed it like that. I mean, oh, God, small minds, how are we ever going to get progress in science? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, you didn't try and propose it in this country. <laughs> it would have been ten times worse. <laughs> yeah, but I just think that, that, that the, the point is to take ideas. It, quantum information is the the easiest entree into learning quantum mechanics, much easier than the conventional way of learning quantum mechanics. You can be up and running, taking ideas from quantum information and applying it to whatever your favorite subject is, you know, in quantum computer science or in solid state physics or in quantum gravity. You can be up and running in, you know, half a year or even a few months. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a, it's, it provides a unifying language for understanding all these systems. And, I just recommend it highly to anybody who wants to understand what's going on in the universe. Well, there you go. Go to MIT and, and study with Seth or anybody else in, in, in the Boston area. Well, there's quantum groups or all over throughout the world. The world. Yes, yes, there's enough quantum quantum groups Singapore, Canada, Japan, Australia, Australia's Australia, got money. Germany, Italy, France, England. Just go for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Seth. Thanks very much for sitting down uh, for 45 minutes to chat. Thank you very much. It's been enjoy great the talking. rest of your time in Japan. Thanks. Cheers. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks for that. Great. It came in at a nice